educators want to help you grow. And growing can be hard, but it shouldn't be traumatic. It really shouldn't. If it's traumatic, there's something wrong. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 35. Today, I welcome Dr. Eva Micah, who obtained her PhD in clinical community psychology from DePaul University, Chicago in 1998. And before I tell you more about this amazing person, I want to give you the backstory for this episode. Eva and I worked together in a graduate program with doctoral learners over 10 years ago, and I was always in awe of not only her kindness to me as a colleague, but also of her ability to powerfully mentor doctoral learners. Now, knowing she was no longer working with these types of students, I asked her if she would be willing to come on the show to provide the unique perspective that can only be gained through that thing we call hindsight. And lucky for all of us, she said yes. Now let me tell you just a little bit more about Dr. Micah. She is a leader, educator, advocate, and applied researcher. She loves the unique opportunities related to online and blended instruction and thrives on helping adult learners acquire the practical skills related to applied psychology including the ability to become more adept problem solvers through the critical evaluation and application of research evidence to social and organizational problems in service towards a more just community. Eva is currently Acting Associate Dean for the School of Continuing and Professional Studies at Loyola University, Chicago, where she embraces and promotes Cura Personalis as part of the Ignatian heritage of caring for the entire person And I want to offer her a congratulations because prior to this appointment, she was hired to lead the online psychology bachelor degree and certificate programs. And under her leadership, the online applied psychology bachelor degree is now ranked number two in the country in U.S. News and World Report. So if anyone you know out there is looking for a bachelor's in psychology, be sure to check this program out and I'll link it in the show notes below. So Eva, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Heather. Today, we're going to get into this discussion about mentorship. And a good mentor or a good mentor relationship can be the difference between finishing or not finishing. So let's just start with how do you define mentoring or how have you seen it play out in the dissertation process? Well, I'm no longer involved in the dissertation process, but I have had several years under my belt. And so I've had time to reflect on best practices. And you're absolutely right. The relationship between the chair in particular and the doctoral student mentee is key. So when I think about mentorship in the doctoral phase, what we were really inviting people to do is not just to produce a document but really inviting them into the profession and inviting them to become a peer and inviting them on a a career journey or extending an existing career journey. So with that in mind, there is, I think, an ethical responsibility to be mindful of why is this person getting the degree? Does it make sense for them? How does it fit in with the rest of their lives? If they are adult learners and they're working full time and they have families, which is uh, one kind of bracket of people that are pursuing the doctoral degree, then what does that mean for the rest of their, their lives? There's going to be parts that are going to have to be put on hold. There's going to be leisure time that will have to be forsaken. And the question then becomes, are these sacrifices worth it for you in the long run? And every person has a different response. Every person has a different story. And I think that exploration, I think, is something that a good mentor does with you. You hit on such an important point about just getting to know the student that you're working with and asking questions. I have worked with many students who feel like there's just person at the other end of the computer that doesn't know them, that 
doesn't maybe care about them, that the feedback is coming across as sometimes even hurtful, even though it's not intended that way, because they haven't taken time to establish this relationship. So as a mentor, you could say, all right, I know that this is probably important. It's going to take a little bit of time. But in my perspective, in my experience, it actually saves time later when you actually know what's going on with a student's life and you can view them as this whole person. As a student, what are some things that you would recommend in terms of either finding a chair that they could develop this relationship with or facilitating this type of relationship if the chair isn't kind of starting it? Well, I think those those are some really poignant questions. I think that your question illuminates a really important point, which is successful doctoral candidates who transition into doctors, the PhDs, the DBAs, the EDDs, are ones that I think are very assertive. In other words, don't assume, although the mentor may have best practices, but don't assume that your chair is going to reach out to you for a couple of reasons. One is structurally, they are often overwhelmed with just the high volume. So there are systemic problems that are coming from that are beyond this conversation. So they may want to get to know you, but if they have 50 to 60 people that they're chairing, that proves to be difficult, even if they want to. Secondly, who's going to get the most attention? It's the person that asks for it. So don't be afraid to ask. Ask for a one-on-one in the beginning. Ask for something and you will likely receive it because it's going to, I don't know many, well, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I don't know many professors, educators, mentors who would turn down, hey, can I have 30 minutes with you just to get to know you in the beginning of this? I think actually, in most cases, that would be a welcome request, because then you can establish trust. Then you can say, here, this is my style. I tend to make some blunt comments, but here's what, you know, the context of it. You know who I am. Here's my face. And if you have questions, let's do this, you know, every three or four months or something realistic. So I think that While we can talk about best practices for chairs, I think best practices to be a good doctoral candidate is to be assertive, knock on that door. You might just get a response. You might just get a cup of coffee or a tea. You might virtually, I mean, it's metaphorical, but ask for it. I mean, people are longing for that. And actually from the perspective of if you're chairing a dissertation and you have someone who wants to invest in that, then you shine. I mean, you really kind of stand out because then from my perspective, I'm thinking, wow, this person is taking this seriously. This person understands that the relationship is important. This person understands and wants me to get to know them. So that's a good sign because that tells me they're invested. They're not just going through the motions. So it's a good thing for all involved. You know, this theme of the student having the courage to ask questions comes up again and again. So many faculty will say, just ask. We know that you don't know how to do this because in most cases, this is the first time you've done this. Yes, some people are glutton for punishment and they come back for two doctorates, but (laughs) in most cases we can assume you don't know what you're doing. We forget that you don't know what you're doing sometimes. So ask us and look, let's face it. Most people go into education because they want to help someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you want to see people grow. I think the courage comes from one is being concerned about rejection, get used to rejection. So accept that it's not personal. The other thing I would say is that you don't really need courage if you're respectful. So I think one of the challenges is the way that you ask the question will either elicit a learning opportunity or a defensive response on the part of your chair. Because while your chair wants to help you grow, they don't want to be put on the defensive where they're having to defend their feedback or kind of getting into a power struggle about why you think you're right and they're wrong. It's usually somewhere in the middle. So approach it from a respectful point of view. Approach it as I really want to learn from you. And then I think it becomes less scary and less likely that you're going to get a response that isn't very helpful because chairs are people too, but respect them. They're experts. They do know what they're talking about. They don't want to sign their name on something that doesn't 
meet quality standards. That's not helping you. It's not helping anyone. So respect their expertise, be open to it, but be open to, you know, being able to say, hey, well, what about this? And can I think about things this way? Is there another way of looking at it? I don't know many people that wouldn't be open to that kind of approach. You know, even this idea of how you approach the chair also comes up because we talk about this situation of getting really critical feedback and how it's so easy to take it personal and you might shoot off an email or a text message to your chair i need to talk to you right now or i just got this committee's feedback and i'm freaking out this really is to go back to the point that you made in the beginning this is almost an apprenticeship into a field and the chair's role is to guide you and mentor you through this process of becoming a professional in this larger framework of academia and you don't want to be shooting off emails or doing anything that would call into question your growth as a scholar. So taking that time to think about what is that email going to look like when you're requesting help to approach it from this growth mindset. I know you've got the information I need. I'm confused. I'm frustrated. I'm hurt. I'm sad. Whatever emotions you're feeling to be candid with yourself and honest with yourself and reach out in, in a respectful way. To reach out in a respectful way and then also find other means of support. I mean, one of the reasons I didn't want to do that work anymore is because I got very burnt out on dealing with anger, frustration, trauma, however you want to call it. And no one wants to be inflicting trauma on other people. So I think there needs to be reform to the process. But given that, there has to be some sense of being able to compartmentalize the product from who you are as a person and being able to take in information and feedback in a way that says, this isn't about me. This is about somebody really helping me or wanting to help me grow. And by nature of the way that it's structured, you're going to be getting sometimes conflicting feedback. So knowing how to wrestle with that and sit with that beyond even reaching out to your chair, because your chair is not your mother. They're not your parents. They're not your spouse. I mean, they're not. That to me is not a realistic expectation either. And then you're setting up a dynamic where potentially the chair's walking on eggshells and that's not what you want either. So being able to be kind of open to support from other places and recognizing the role that your chair has, which is ultimately to steer you in a quality product and to steer you into a professional role, but they don't want to hurt you. They're trying to offer you what they know and it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy to write a dissertation. It will never be easy. So it's always going to be a lot of work. It's always going to be iterative. So the real question then becomes, are you willing to go through that journey? And that's a real question you need to ask. No one can answer that for you. And there's no right or wrong answer. I don't think everyone needs to be doing a dissertation. It doesn't mean you're less worthy, less smart, less competent, less capable, or less marketable. So if you are choosing this, then don't be a victim, be empowered. You are choosing it, basically. No one is forcing anyone that I know to get a dissertation done. So if you're choosing it, then choose the good and the bad, because there's going to be all of it. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be arduous. And if you don't want to accept the good and the bad, then perhaps it's not for you. And that's okay. I mean, that's okay, I think, to say this isn't for me. I don't want to do this. Okay, fine. That's good. But don't be a victim in it. Eva, you have such a nice way of so beautifully articulating so many messages that have come through on previous podcasts with Dr. Stewart, who talked about feedback, and Dr. Capanelli, who basically, like you said, hey, this is a big decision and it's not for everyone. Ah. And if you make this choice, then it's really the burden is on you to ensure you've got a good relationship with your chair to do your part, but understanding there's boundaries there. Your chair cannot be your end all be all. You need peer support, you need family support, you need friend support. It's an often overused phrase, but truly it takes a village. It's true. 
Yeah, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. And then I would ask, what do I want? Because in my experience, some of the people that I've mentored have just not enjoyed the process. They've hated research. So then my question is, why are you doing this? If you hate research so much, if you hate the idea of building scholarship, then why are you engaging in a process that you hate so much? It's never going to feel good. If it's always about the, this end goal, the title or whatever it is, then what do you think it's going to get you? Because that's a valid question. I mean, sometimes we choose experiences that we don't enjoy because we want a certain outcome. My concern becomes when people don't enjoy the process or it's so negative, then they continue doing it because they want an outcome. And then they realize that the outcome doesn't give them what they want either. The, the goal would be for you to enjoy the process and make sure that the outcome is really something that is worthwhile. So. Because if, as a student, if you are, and look, there's going to be times just like any big goal we're working on where you've got some discomfort about something or you're feeling tired or you're feeling overwhelmed. But if you've got this overwhelming sense, this prevalent, persistent sense of just loathing the process, as a student, it's very difficult to mentor you as a chair. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then what does that mean for you? We don't want you to be miserable. I mean, if you're loathing the process, maybe there's a way that we can talk about the process and then you have a frank conversation. And that's where the trust and kind of the open relationship I think is really important because the chair could tell you, the chair sees the whole process. So they understand that when you give feedback, it's not to shoot you down. It's not that we're going to fail you. It's because we want you to improve your product and it's going to be constantly improved. Scholarship doesn't mean perfection. And so the chair has that vision, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you think, oh my gosh, I've got all of these comments. So that must mean I'm dumb or I'm not capable or my chair is just out to get me. If you reframe it as no, hang in there. So if you're making a foundational error, then you're going to need to fix that because at some point you will will continue to be investing in a house that's just going to fall apart. And it's all about the foundation. But if it's about refinement, if it's about things that are, you know, the window dressings, then have faith that you'll get through it. And that's, that's actually a really good question I would ask if I were a candidate, I would say to my chair, are the bones good right now? Is my foundation sound? Because if it is, then you can trust that you can keep investing in the product. And even if you get different opinions about other aspects of it or fine tuning or interpretation, you have a good product. If the chair says, mm, I'm really concerned right now, then listen to your chair. I mean, don't be stubborn about wanting to pursue something. Your chair has told you this isn't going to work. And I can't tell you how many times I've said really frankly to people, this isn't going to work. And they just keep going and going and going. And then they're surprised and shocked when they get feedback from other committee members a year down the line that says, this isn't going to work. So we're not trying to tear down your idea. We're trying to give you honest feedback. Take it. If it's not foundationally sound, that's a bad sign and a sign for you to do something different. Yeah, I've seen that situation where it's almost like a hungry dog with a bone. Yeah. And the student doesn't want to let this idea go. And they've thought, this is the project I've been wanting to do all these years. And your committee is there to say, I get it. But for this situation in time and with the goal of you getting a product that meets the university's criteria and earns you this degree and gets you out of here so you can move on, we need to rethink how to do this. Exactly. And so it sounds like another characteristic that's coming through, if we're going to talk about how to be a good mentee, listen and trust that your chair has your best interests at heart. And, and part of it then becomes, if you're so attached to an idea, you may gr have to grieve it. In fact, some of the advice I got when I was a grad student is don't pick something you have your heart really invested in, because then it'll be much harder to adapt. And I think that's right and to some extent. So if that doesn't mean you shouldn't, but be mindful of the fact that your dissertation is not your own to some extent. It's not. It's a peer-reviewed 
collegial scholarly document. And there's a part of that that sometimes feels icky, like, well, this is my idea and it's a good idea. And it may very well be an awesome idea, but it may be an idea that people have already done extensively. It may be an idea that would be awesome if you were in an institute and you had lots of different resources, but you don't. I mean, the idea itself is only a piece. It, the pragmatics and actually going through the motions is really where you differentiate whether an idea can be successful or not. So there's lots of great ideas sitting on shelves. The key is to take your idea and see what pieces of it need to be morphed so that they can be brought alive and then you can contribute something. There is danger mm -hmm. in pursuing something that you're really passionate about in terms of being able to not only approach it without bias, sometimes it's something you're passionate about because it's something you've experienced. And so there may be some trauma that emerges during the process. And I think a good rule of thumb would be, hey, is your general topic area something that you see yourself involved in five, 10 years down the road? Is your piece of doctoral research really a logical stepping stone on this larger career path? Or is it just this like pet hobby that you have? Or sometimes it's a pet theory you want to try to prove. Listen to your chair, listen to your committee, let them help you shape something that makes sense for your unique individual situation. Yes. And that's where the holistic part comes. There's no I think cookie cutter approach. No one can answer for you whether or not a dissertation is right for you and whether you should enter the program, enter the process, finish the process. But I think there are ways for you to become more empowered in it if you kind of look behind the curtain. If you have a good chair that trusts you, we'll help you and say, look, it's not uncommon for you to get two or three pushbacks first. We want to see what you can do. That doesn't mean we're going to fail you, but that comes from the trust and kind of understanding the larger process and kind of what we have in mind. But if you experience it as, oh gosh, I got all this feedback. So that means I must be a failure and I'm going to be kicked out. I could see why that would be really devastating and hard. So the interpretation is really key. And I think that's where the relationship with your chair comes in. And a good chair will tell you this isn't going to work. You have to reformulate this and this is how we're going to do it. That's a good chair. Listen to them. <laughs> On the other hand, a good chair will also tell you, this is a great idea. I like what you got here. I got a couple of ideas of how it could be better and how it could be stronger and ways to help you navigate feedback from someone else. That's also a good chair is helping you navigate that. So reach out to them. I think one of the main themes coming out of today's call is to ask with respect, show up at the table in a way where you are building trust with your chair. Because when we think about this holistic approach, I can't tell you how many times I've had students who have told me things very late in the game. They're studying something that's highly traumatic, but I don't know that because they didn't say, and oh, by the way, this happened to me when I was 12, or oh, by the way, I have a son that, that experienced this, and your chair needs this information. Be candid. Disclose things that may play an important role on you finishing this journey. And really one thing that I have learned from chairing students is communication, communication on both ends. As a chair, sometimes I forget to ask, hey, tell me, how did you feel after you got that feedback? Typically, faculty are busy people, <laughs> whether they're running grants or they've got a, a small business on the side. And so being an advocate for yourself, yes. remembering you yes. chose this not falling into any sort of victim mentality and doing what you can to approach the situation so that you build trust, you respect the chair and trust the process. Yeah. And I would say, don't come at it from a sense of entitlement. I know that that sometimes you start feeling like, well, I'm paying for this. You're paying for the opportunity and for a quality experience. No one owes you the PhD or doctoral degree. And if you approach it that way, I guarantee that it'll probably be not met with a very helpful response <laughs> necessarily. So, you know, your chair is a human being as well. They may forget what it's like to get feedback, 
but also be mindful of the fact if you choose something that is really heart wrenching for you or that is going to be traumatic, yes, be candid with your chair, but be mindful they are not your therapist. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, in terms of role clarification and kind of boundaries, that's not fair to you or them. So if you're embarking on something that is traumatic or is going to potentially evoke trauma, I'm not necessarily saying don't do that because some of the richest scholarship comes from that then you need to make sure that you have the support, whatever that means, so that it's not being acted out in your progress, because then you're going to be evoking all of these traumatic feelings or emotions and also falling behind in your scholarship. And that's not going to feel good. And that's going to be compounded. And there's only so much that a chair in their role can do. They can be compassionate. They can be open. They can be flexible, but Ultimately, their their focus is on the theory, the idea. They care about your experience, but be mindful of the of the role because chairs are not trained to be therapists or crisis intervention people. Although sometimes we have to act that way, but we have to be really clear about what we can expect from our committee members and what we can't. And there's a fine line. So. Yeah, those are such great points. Such great points. And I think when I reflect back on some of the students who have been the most fun to mentor, these are students who were open with me, who asked to meet, because I will assume, hey, you're busy too. I'm not a micromanager. I don't think most chairs are. You will need to ask me to meet. And the students who get through most efficiently, where there's fewest number of miscommunications are the ones that will say things like, hey, can I get on your calendar once a month just for a 15 minute check in face to face with the camera? And they're the ones who will say things to me like without getting into details, I've got something going on in my family right now, or I've got a personal crisis going on, I need to take a month off, let your chair know enough that's going on. So we know where to step in and when we need to direct you to other services. But again, like you said, the chair isn't your therapist. You need to be getting support where you need to get support. But an open line of communication can be your saving grace during this process. I really like what you said about your chair assumes, right, that no news is good news. We assume at your level that you're being autonomous. What do I mean by that? at least the way I approach undergraduate education or even non-doctoral phase is there typically is more structure, perhaps more handholding, but you've gotten to this point where you are now embarking on creating new knowledge and becoming a scholar. I don't expect that I'm going to need to do as many kind of structural things for you because I'm assuming that you have developed enough as a scholar yourself by now to be able to become more autonomous. That doesn't mean disconnected, though. It just means a different level. It means a different level of support. So if you reach out and you say, I am feeling a little bit lost and I would like some more structure, that's awesome. But but I think the default is this person has gotten to where they are because they are smart and competent and determined and resilient and they have skills. So why would we want to micromanage them? But that can maybe feel for someone like, oh, this person is neglecting me or they're not reaching out to me or I'm not getting the structure I did. Again, if you want that structure or need it, maybe that is something that you want or need, or you need to kind of work it out with your chair, then ask for it. But by default, they're going to assume no news is good news. That's true, because it takes so long to work on each part of the dissertation, right? Whether it's your chapter two, you could go off for months. I remember I was gone for months writing this thing. My chair, we didn't talk at all about my chapter two. It was like a six month period. Here's my chapter two. And so- we assume you're working. Yes. So if you're not and you need more accountability, you need to reach out and ask for that. Yeah, and that's okay. It's okay to say, you know what, I really am getting kind of lost. Could I get some more support right now? Yeah, of course, sure. But understand that not everybody wants that. There's other people that would find that annoying. <laughs> so exactly. our default is we're going to let you be a free agent until you need and you ask. So that's really the crux of it. Ask for what you need reasonably. And by that, we don't mean 
getting your idea through without any changes, because that's not going to be realistic. That's not a realistic expectation, but ask for the relationship that you need. And that might change. I mean, you may need a lot of support in the beginning and at the end you're flying, or maybe during the methodology section, you're feeling a little bit more lost and you need more support, or, you know, maybe you're getting nervous towards the end. We all have our different journeys. Assume by default that your chair is a caring educator who's doing this because they love to see people grow in their ideas and in their professionalism. That's the optimistic perspective. Again, if you encounter someone that's not like that, then find someone else. But overall, you know, that's my experience. Educators want to help you grow and growing can be hard, but it shouldn't be traumatic. It really shouldn't. If it's traumatic, there's something wrong. In developing this relationship that can be the difference between you enjoying the process and even graduating doesn't need to take a long time. That's one point I really like to stress. Like you said, a half hour phone call at the beginning, check-ins here and there, it doesn't need to be this big, overwhelming thing. It can happen very naturally, very organically over the course of a couple of meetings if both the chair and the student are willing to just communicate in an open and candid way. Yes. And again, best practices would say that your chair reaches out to you and invites you to do that. I mean, that's what I used to do is when I was assigned someone new, I would welcome them and ask them, do you need a one-on-one in the beginning? If they do that, then take them up on it. I mean, that's a blessing. But if they don't, again, ask, be an advocate, because we're assuming that you're a free agent and that you're going along and no news is good news. So if you're lost or confused or feeling, you know, that you need a little more support, ask for it, but become prepared. I mean, that's the other piece. So if we as a chair, as a committee member have given you resources and readings and you come unprepared, then we start feeling that our feedback isn't reaching you or that you're not taking it seriously or you're not implementing it. So while we're not expecting that you're going to take feedback and be able to just turn it around and understand it completely, if we give you a resource, read it. (laughs) Or say, I tried and I really don't know what's going on here. Fine. That's where the magic happens in education. But if you come And the chair or committee member says, well, I sent you to this information about sample size. Oh, I didn't get to it. The the perception then becomes from the chair committee member, this person isn't really implementing what I have to say. And then that becomes a snowball effect because if you continue and continue and continue and you're not implementing feedback at some point, you're going to get stopped. And that's when you start getting frustrated and and maybe where it starts feeling real when something gets rejected, right? Your proposal gets rejected, but you've been getting feedback all along that you haven't really implemented. So it's okay not to understand all the feedback. It's okay if someone says, read this resource and for you to say, I really don't know what this is. It's not okay not to take that feedback seriously. It's not okay not to read those resources because then you're not doing your part. I mean, then you're not, you're not coming to the table with the work that you need to do in order for your chair to help you grow. I love when you said that's where the magic of education happens. Do your best to understand the feedback, look at the resources, but also understand that we need you As chairs, we need you to come to us and say, I tried to read that resource. This is what I got from it. I'm still confused. That's where the relationship really starts to mesh. Absolutely. Then you have something. Then you have a foundation. Then you're talking at the same language. You can't be on a level field if you're not talking the same language of research or scholarship or theory. And when they provide you resources, they're saying, hey, I want you to catch up here so that we can have a collegial conversation about this research scholarship theory. There's a language involved. I mean, the way academics talk to each other, practitioners, there's a language. And in order for you to communicate effectively with your committee members, you have to become 
well versed in that language and we're trying to do that with you so that's a piece of it as well and that is where the magic happens it's like any other coaching experience you have to do your part if you're not training if you're not bringing your equipment if you don't bring your ski boots or snowshoes or whatever metaphor you want then what are we what are we supposed to do we can just kind of look at you and say, well, you're in the snow now, but we can't really teach you to ski until you put your skis on. So you have to be equipped, you know, do do what you can to be equipped. And, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking these situations where a student is struggling with understanding something and going to the chair, asking for more instruction, more guidance, and the chair filling in that gap, it really is practice for being part of the profession, right? Because I think there's this idea that once you have your doctorate, you're going to know everything. And my goodness, just like you said, chairs and committee members are people too. I can't tell you how often I am reaching out to my colleagues saying, is this right? Hey, if if I say it this way, does this make sense? I have a student proposing this and I think it makes sense, but are we missing something here? That is part of academic discourse, questioning each other, being curious, looking for better ways to solve problems. And so Mm -hmm. having the ability to be candid, hey, I'm not so sure, can someone check this over? That's part of being a colleague. Yeah, it really is. And the evolution of theory and knowledge is evolving all the time. And we all have to stay open curious and humble because none of us know everything but you know the pursuit of knowledge is something that that should be creative and magical and wondrous and not necessarily easy but you know that's the piece where if you can rekindle some of that or kindle it with your chair then you have something but if it's starting to feel like drudgery or all trauma then either it's not right for you either the journey is really not meant for you and that's okay or the journey needs to be altered in some way and in that case advocate reach out again the chair is not necessarily going to be soliciting you be mindful of the fact that we're assuming that you're free agents and that you're doing your work and that unless we hear from you no news is good news You've given us so many great tips, both for faculty and students, how to create this relationship that can really be an amazing support. So much of what you spoke about today aligns with some previous podcast episodes, and I'll put the links in the show notes below if you're curious, if you're listening, and you're like, I want to hear more about that. But Eva, often I ask my guests at the end, hey, do you have any final words of wisdom or maybe a favorite quote that you used either with your students or to get yourself through your graduate program? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. We use the phrase a lot, but life really is short. So choose your experiences wisely. And at some point, if something is costing you quality of life or experience or your ability to shine in the world, then don't do it. I don't want to be in environment systems, workplaces, endeavors that are not helping me be of service to the world in the best way that I can. And that is a personal question that everyone has to ask. So I would ask on a bigger scale, you know, is your doctoral journey really part of your real journey and reason for being here? And if it's not, then... It's a huge investment that you're making that is not part of a core value of who you are. And that's okay, but be aware of the consequences of that. You wouldn't buy a house or think about an investment without really thinking, is this fitting into my life and what I want? Sometimes I think the dissertation often becomes something people feel like they have to just keep plugging on and on. Maybe not. Think about it as a choice as you start, as you embark, and as you continue. Having said that, if you persist and it makes sense for you to persist and you reach out for help, you will finish, likely, unless you're not listening to some real hard feedback. And if you're ignoring feedback, then you you may not. But that's, I think, a fair question is how does this fit in? Is it really helping you shine and becoming who you're meant to be on the planet Earth? Because we're not here that long. You know, we're not here long and the dissertation takes a long time. Is this really helping me in my journey? 
And if it's not, can I tweak the process? Can my chair help me? I mean, I know as a chair, I welcome those experiences when someone, for example, talked about, I need a new career because I'm injured now and I can't do manual labor anymore. So I have to switch into something that's more academic. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so this is going to be difficult, but it makes sense in your journey. For other people, I I sometimes wonder, like, why are you doing this? And do you stop and ask yourself, why am I doing this? That's an important question to ask. And no one can really answer it other than yourself. And, you know, Eva, that's an important question to ask whether or not you're in a doctoral program. (laughs) It sure is. Right. Why am I doing this? (laughs) Exactly. 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 So life skills today for all the listeners (laughs) far and wide. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experience with us today. You're welcome. Take care. If you're enjoying the Happy Doc Student Podcast, could I ask you a big favor? Would you be willing to rate, review, and subscribe? It would help me get noticed by more people like you, people who know there is a better way to navigate the doctoral process. Oh, hey, one more thing. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only. 